God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, out of the house of slavery. And you shall have no other gods before me, and you shall have Kids, it's Mr. Mark here, and uh oh. Uh, 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 ah! <coughs> Ooh, sorry about that. Today we're going to be reading chapter 8 from The Biggest Story. And before we get started, let's look at some things that you might need for today's lesson. If you have one at home, you might want a copy of The Biggest Story. If you don't have one, don't worry, we'll be reading the story for you right here today. Some things you'll also need are your eyes, your ears, some paper, something to write or draw with, something to color with, a chair, some hand sanitizer, a Lego X-Wing, a giant stuffed animal, an extra large football, a big soft cube, some bubbles, a balloon, and of course you'll need to bring yourself. Now that we have the materials we need, let's get our bodies ready to learn about Jesus. As you all know, there's definitely one thing that we do not want to happen when we are learning about Jesus. If you said pull a muscle, go ahead and put one hand in the air and give yourself a high five. So if you don't want to pull a muscle, what's the one thing that we need to do? Stretch it out! All right, boys and girls, for our first stretch, we're gonna stand up. Everybody stand up. Actually, you know what? I just remembered. For this one, we gotta sit down. Everybody sit down. Ah. Oh, you know what? Now that I'm sitting down, I think we need to stand up. Everybody stand up. No, it's sit down. It's definitely sit down. Sit down, sit down. You know what? Maybe it is stand up. Up, 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 up. Okay, okay, okay. For our first stretch, we go down, touch your toes, and reach for the sky. Touch your toes, reach for the sky. Touch your toes, reach for the sky. Touch your toes, reach for the sky. Toes, sky, toes, sky, toes, sky. Stand everybody hands on your hips. Okay, good. And now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a quick Lap, everyone take a lap. Here we go. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hang on. Sorry about that, boys and girls. For our next stretch, shake it up. 
Boom. And then take this leg right here, shake it up. Uh, step. Okay, good. And now take this hand right here and everyone say hello. And then we're gonna go down, touch this toe and back up. And then everyone take this hand right here and say hello. Touch this toe and back up. And this toe, 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 and this toe. Okay, and everybody hands on your head and baby steps to the middle. And everyone spin around one time. And everyone take a seat. If your hands are still on your head, go ahead and put one hand in the air and give yourself a high five. All right, we have one thing left to do before we read our story. What's that? That's right, we need to pray. So will you all please pray with me? Let's fold our hands and lock them together so we're not touching anyone else or distracting anyone else. And let's close our eyes and bow our heads so we can give God our full respect and attention. I will pray for us. Here we go. Father God, we come to you in prayer. God, we thank you for this day. God, I thank you for all of the kids who are watching this, whether it's in their in their own houses or in their friends' houses. God, we thank you for this time to learn about you. Holy Spirit, will you please be here? Will you give us all ears to listen and to learn? And Holy Spirit, will you please give me and our other teachers words to say? Jesus, we love you and need you. Pray all these things in your name. Amen. Good morning, LS kids. I am so excited to be able to read our next part of our story from our Jesus Storybook Bible. So if you guys don't have it yet, go grab it quick. Go run. I'll wait. Go, go, go. Okay, good. You got it. All right, here we go. We are on page 326. Got it? 326. Okay. So if you remember what happened last time we were reading and Jesus had just risen from the grave, right? And he had come out of the tomb and he went and he saw all of his friends. And what did he tell his friends to do? To go and tell them the good news. And then he rose back into heaven. And then he said, I will come back for you. I have a plan and I'm coming back. So in the meantime, now we're focusing on what God's friends are doing. So here we go. God sends help. That's the name of the story. Jesus' friends and helpers huddled together in the stuffy upstairs room. Even though it was sunny outside, the shutters were closed and the door was locked. Wait in Jerusalem, Jesus had told them. I'm going to send you a special present. God's power is going to come into you. God's Holy Spirit is coming. So here they were, waiting. Actually, mostly what they were doing was being scared and hiding, but you can't really blame them. Their best friend had left. The important people and leaders were after them, and Jesus had given, given them a job, and they didn't know how to do it, so it was kind of scary. As they waited, they were praying and remembering, and remembering how from the beginning, God had been working out his secret rescue plan. And all of the things that God had done had come true, and he had followed through on all of his promises, so they were scared. They were still trusting God. Suddenly, a strong wind filled the room, whistling through the walls, rustling through the straw on the floor, and there, on everyone's heads, shining in the gloom, were flickering flames. Wouldn't you be freaked out if you were in a dark room and then all of a sudden a bunch of light and fire were on top of your head? It'd be kind of a little weird. Fire that didn't burn or hurt, and something more inside their hearts. They felt a strange heat, almost as if the coldness and hardness was melting away, as if their broken hearts were mending, and God was giving them brand new hearts, hearts that could work properly in the right way. How it happened, they didn't know, but they knew God's power had struck their hearts ablaze, and God, Jesus himself was coming to live inside them. They had seen Jesus go away, but now he was closer than he had ever been inside their hearts with them all the time. And this time there was nothing that could separate them. Jesus would always be there with them, loving them, loving them, whispering the promise that would get rid of the poison and the terrible lie and the sickness in their hearts. God's wonderful promise to them, you are my child and I love you. Make your home in me, and as I make my home in you, Jesus had said. Could it be heaven was coming into their hearts? So when we say that we have the Holy Spirit within us, that's what we mean, is that Jesus is with us all the time, no matter what. That's pretty stinking cool. And they threw open the shutter, sunlight flooded the room as their hearts filled, filled, and love filled their hearts. And the little room was filled with happy noises, dancing, feet, singing, laughing. They unlocked the door and surged out into the streets as if they had never been afraid. Peter spoke in a loud voice so everyone could hear. Jesus died for you, he said, because he loves you. But God made him live again. Isn't that so cool? He, he rescued you. 
People stopped and listened. The words sank down deep in their hearts and worked like medicine that makes you feel better and works well, like an antidote to a deadly poison, like a kiss that wakes you from a deep sleep. Stop running away from God, Peter said. Run to him instead so he can love you and make you free. And Peter told them of the wonderful story of God's love, God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love, how Jesus had come and all that had happened. That's a pretty awesome story. I mean, wouldn't you be so excited to tell that story? There were lots of people from far away countries in Jerusalem. They couldn't speak the same language, but they listened to Peter. Everyone could understand what he was saying in their own languages. So this person might have been speaking Spanish or might only understand Spanish, but he understood what he was saying. And this person might have spoke French, but totally understood what he was saying. And this person might have understood English, but they could still understand. That's what the power of God can do. So many people believed and many became Jesus's new friends and helpers and the wonderful news of Jesus spread like sparks from a fire to villages, towns, cities, every day more and more people believed. And so it was that the family of God's children, his special people grew. One man watching though said, I'll stop this. Saul said, but this was God's plan and nothing in the world would ever be able to stop it. See this guy right here? This is Saul and this is who we're going to talk about next week. So I love this story because it's really, really important to remember even when we have hard times or even when we're a little confused and just like those people and God's friends at the beginning of the story when they're all huddled in a room and they're scared and they're upset. I mean, think about it. They had their friend just left and they had a really important job to do. They, they didn't even know where to start and a bunch of people were after them and they were all so scared. But then God had his presence in them with the Holy Spirit and that helped them be brave and strong just like Jesus wants us to be. And so when you get scared, when you're not sure, when you're confused, when you're not sure what on earth is going on, then that's when you can remember you have the Holy Spirit in you and the Holy Spirit will guide you and help you walk alongside with Jesus with whatever it is that you're trying to overcome and trying to tackle because you can handle it. And that's why God has you here. And that's why he loves you because you are strong enough to handle it when you have God with you. So I am really excited because next time we get to talk about Saul, which is kind of a bunch of people's favorite story, kind of mine too. So I'm really, really excited. I hope you guys are having a happy summer. I know tomorrow a whole bunch of you start school. So if you haven't started school yet, good luck, study hard, and I hope to see you guys soon. Bye! All right, boys and girls, it's time to stand up out of your seats because we're going to worship our God together. Psalm 55, 22. Cast your cares on the Lord and He will sustain you. He will sustain you. Cast your cares on the Lord sustain you. He will sustain you. And He will never, never, never let the righteous fall. Let the righteous fall. No. He will never, never, never let the righteous fall. Let the righteous fall. No. on the Lord, and He will sustain you, He will sustain you, I said cast your cares on the Lord, and He will sustain you, He will sustain you, and He will never, never, never let the righteous fall. Let the righteous fall, no He will never, never, never let the righteous fall Let the righteous fall, no Yeah.
cast your cares on the Lord He will sustain you He will sustain you Praise the Lord from the heavens, praise Him in the heights above, praise Him all His angels, praise Him all His heavenly hosts, praise Him sun and moon, praise Him all you shining stars, praise Him you highest heavens and you waters above the for joining us this week. I hope you have a great week and we'll see you next time.
Good morning, Living Stones. My name is Derek Anderson. I am a Covenant member and a community group leader here. If this is your first time joining us, a special welcome goes out to you. If you are a Covenant member or a regular attender, I can't wait to see you guys in the near future. If you have any questions throughout the service today, feel free to email them to elko at lschurches.com. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for my church family. I am blessed you brought these people into my life and glad to call them my brothers and sisters. I pray for them today as we deal with difficult challenges in life. I pray they constantly look to you through the good and bad. You are the true God. Thank you for loving us. Amen. As a call to worship today, will you please stand with me? Hebrews 13, 15 says, Through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge His name. Together, church, let's lift up our voices and give praise to our good God. Oh 
At Living Stones Church, our worship of God encompasses every aspect of our lives. We worship Him because He has given His only Son, Jesus, who lived a perfect, sinless life on our behalf, only to willingly lay down His life on a Roman cross as a sacrifice for sin. In His resurrection from the dead, we find hope, joy, and peace. Because of what He has done for us, in gratitude, we give our all to Him. At Living Stones, we exist to be in the city for the city, which means that we strive to see our community blessed and desire that it continue to thrive and be a great place to live, work, and raise a family. Because God has been so good to us, we strive to share His love with others. When you worship with your tithes and offerings, you are directly changing the lives of people in our community. You are helping the poor and those in need. You're ensuring that kids and teens are getting the help and guidance they need to navigate this world and grow into healthy adults. You are part of keeping resources available for struggling marriages that they might be restored. And you're ensuring that our church remains a place of hope and healing for all people. Without you, we cease to exist. Also know that your financial worship goes far beyond our city as well, reaching around the world through missionary and church planner support, and even providing safe, clean drinking water for those in developing countries around the world who don't have access to it. Every dollar given in Jesus' name changes lives. Thank you for being a part of all God is doing. Thank you for being in the city for the city. Today we are continuing in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 4 through 7. If you would all please grab a Bible and stand for the reading of God's Word. If you don't own a Bible and would like one, please email us at elcolschurches.com with your name and mailing address, and we would love to send you a Bible. Hebrews 11, 4 through 7 says, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gift. And through this, through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God, and without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for, sa for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are not worthy of your love, yet you continue to pour it over us. I pray for Pastor Nathan as he preaches your word to us today. 
Be with him today as he brings us your word. Amen. Please be seated. What's up, Living Stones? How we doing? My name is Kyle, and I'm one of the pastors here at Living Stones Reno, and it's my privilege to be able to preach the Word to you today. And I just want to say a special welcome to the Elko Church. Uh, what's up, Elko? How are you guys doing? I love you. Uh, we're grateful to be able to uh, just preach the Word to you. We're grateful for the work that you're doing up there um, in uh, Elko, and we're also grateful for the continued faithfulness that you guys have. We are going to get through this year. COVID 2020 year has been terrible and hard in so many ways, but God is with us. Jesus is on the throne and we're going to get through this and he's going to be exalted. Also want to say a special welcome to those of you who are not yet Christians or people who are investigating the faith. And uh, maybe you're coming today with a lot of questions about what, what is Christianity? What is this all about? And today is a great day for you to be here because uh, today we're talking about what is Christianity. And one of the things that we believe as Christians is that we live a life of faith. We live a life of faith. It is faith that pleases God. That's what we believe as Christians, that it is faith that pleases God. And we're going to be discovering that today in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going through verses four through seven. And uh, this passage is a passage that shows us that it is faith that pleases God. And, and you might ask the question, well, what does faith look like? What does it look like? You know, I ask that question. I'm, I'm a kind of guy who I don't want you just to tell me, I want you to show me. Uh, and I have this in so many aspects of my life. You know, one of the things I like to do is exercise. I've always liked doing that or playing sports. And, and if you were just to sit here and tell me an exercise, I probably wouldn't understand. I would say, hey, thank you for telling me, but I need you to show me. Show me what you're talking about so I can do it. Um, even when it comes to reading instructions, I hate reading instructions unless they have pictures. If they have pictures, I'm like, sweet. A lot of times I don't even read the words. I just look at the pictures. That's probably why I put the stuff together wrong a lot of the time. But I like to see it, not just hear it. Um, you know, I've done my fair share of working on cars. I'm by no means a, uh, a great gearhead or anything like that. But, um, you know, sometimes people will talk to me about what's broken in the car and what I need to fix. And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I need you to show me. And if you show me, I could probably be able to fix it. That's why I love YouTube. YouTube has helped me work on so many cars. It's been great because it shows me exactly what I need to do. And when it comes to faith, a lot of times we don't want to just be told what to do or what faith is. We need to be shown what it looks like. We need to be shown what it looks like. And that's what today's passage is. In this passage, the author is telling his church what faith looks like. And he does it through three pictures, three portraits of people from the Old Testament. Um, and Genesis 4, Genesis 5, and Genesis 6. And those three people are Abel, Enoch, and Noah. And that's how we're going to break down the sermon today. We're going to talk about Abel, Enoch, and Noah, and what they show us about faith, because it's faith that pleases God. Okay, so let's first look at Enoch, or excuse me, Abel. Verse 4. It says, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And, though his, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. So first we have this portrait of Abel. Now, if you uh, go back and you read the beginning of chapter 4, you're going to read the story of Cain and Abel. 
And these are two brothers. Uh, they're, they're the first children of Adam and Eve. Um, Cain was the older brother. Abel was the younger brother. And uh, Cain was a worker of the ground. He was a farmer. And Abel was a keeper of sheep. He was a shepherd. And uh, they, Cain one day ended up bringing a sacrifice to God. And, and as he brought a sacrifice to God, so did Abel. And uh, all we know about this story is that they both brought sacrifices to God, but then God had regard for Abel's sacrifice, but not Cain. And, you know, there's been lots of speculation about why this is the case. Uh, Some people say that uh, God had regard for Abel's sacrifice because Abel brought a lamb um, and Cain brought vegetables. But the Bible doesn't uh, seem to distinguish that that's why God had uh, regard for Abel's sacrifice. We don't, we don't know that. Um, in fact, later on in the Old Testament, we see that God took pleasure in people bringing him sacrifices of their produce. And so uh, we have to ask the question, why? Why did God have regard for Abel's sacrifice? What made Abel so special in this moment? And there's a little clue. That when you go back to read the story, it says that Abel brought God his first fruits. He brought God a firstborn lamb. And of the firstborn lamb, he brought God the, the, the fat portions of that lamb, which was kind of the treasured portions of the lamb. And, and, and that's different from Cain because it, all it says about Cain is that Cain just brought God a sacrifice. But Abel brought God the best of his sacrifice. And so Abel shows us, first of all, that faith looks like bringing God our best. That's what faith is. Faith is living a life that gives God our best. And one of the first things that we can see from this is that faith is not divorced from works. Um, Faith is not divorced from works. If you were to have faith, but there's no works, that's just hypocrisy. Um, And and then the other thing we can see with that is that it is possible to have works, but not true faith. And I think that's what Cain had. Cain brought a sacrifice. Uh, But this was more just dead religion. He, He went through the works of it, but his heart wasn't in it because he wasn't giving God his best. He wasn't coming to God with with ultimate devotion and gratitude for who God was and what God had done for them. Abel had. Abel understood that God was worthy of his best. And so he willingly and gladly gave God his best. And because of that, Hebrews tells us that God commended Abel. He gave him his divine approval. So faith looks like giving God our best. That's what faith looks like. Um, Not giving God our leftovers. I mean, you know, I I often talk about how if you were to have a a friend or a family member over to your house that you wanted to honor for a special occasion, you don't give them leftovers. You don't say, you know, last night we had some spaghetti. We got some leftover spaghetti. Let's, let's pull this out and give it to you. If you want to honor them, what do you do? You go to the grocery store and you buy them a steak or you buy them their favorite food and then you come home and you labor over it to give them your best because you want to honor them. And that's what the life of faith looks like. The life that we're supposed to have as Christians is a life that isn't just, you know, partially giving to God but a life that is giving to God our best. And this comes in all arenas of our life. It comes to our, the arenas of our finances, the arenas of our time, our emotions, our strength and our energy. Um, this is what Jesus would say later on, that he calls us to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. This is what we see Abel doing. And this is the life of faith, giving God our best. And, and one of the things that happened is Abel made uh, God happy. And when Cain saw that, 
Cain got jealous. And so the first murder in the Bible happens after this offering because Cain goes into the field and in jealousy and anger kills his brother Abel. And what it says in Hebrews is this. It says that though he died, he still speaks. That even though Abel was murdered, his blood is still crying out. And what is his blood crying out? That God is worthy of our best, even when it costs us our life. I mean, what a legacy he left. That thousands of years later, we're still talking about this Abel who who said, I'm going to give my my God the best no matter what, even though it cost him his life. And I pray that as living stones, this would be something that we could be known for. That we could be known as a church that's, that's willing to give God our best, even if it costs us everything. What a legacy that would be. To give God our best, because what pleases God is a life of faith. Um, the second story we see here is the story of Enoch. It says here in verse 5, By faith, Enoch was taken up, so that he should not see death, And he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And so this is the story of Enoch, and it's recorded in Genesis chapter 5, verses 19 through 24. And there's not much said about Enoch. It's literally like a little paragraph this big. Um, But what is said about Enoch is that Enoch pleased God. Now, This Hebrew uh, passage is quoting the Greek version of Genesis. But if you go back and read the Hebrew version of Genesis, which your English Bibles are translated from, instead of it saying Enoch pleased God, what it says is Enoch walked with God. And so what Enoch shows us is this. Enoch shows us that faith looks like walking with God. That's what faith is. Faith is simply walking. Walking with God. Uh, Another way that can be said is getting along with God. Enjoying his companionship. Being God's friend. Having God in every aspect of your life. Faith is not you just showing up to church. A lot of people say, I got faith, I go to church. That's That's not the marker of faith. The marker of faith is you enjoying intimacy and nearness of the living God in every aspect of your life. That's the marker of faith. Walking with God. You know, during uh, the coronavirus uh, quarantine, when we were all at home for several months and trying not to go crazy and kill each other, uh, after dinner, uh, my family would take a walk. And I saw lots of families doing this. And it was so nice. It was such a special gift. Every night we would eat dinner and then we would go for a walk. We'd take a little football and we'd throw it around and and we would talk. I would hold my daughter's hand and she would tell me stories. And we would just walk around the block and enjoy each other's company. There was no agenda. There was no trying to uh, ask each other to do different chores. It was just simply enjoying each other's presence. That's what it means to walk with somebody to be in their presence. It also means to bear one another's burdens. You know, when somebody says, I'm going to walk with you through this, they say, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be right by your side. I'm not going to abandon you in your time of darkness. And that's the God we serve. The God we serve is a God who walks with his people. Even though we walk through the valley of shadow of death, we will fear no evil for he is with us. His rod and his staff It comforts us. He is with us. The story of the Bible is that God is not this distant, powerful, impersonal force, but rather he's a relational God who loves us and wants to walk with us. That's the hope of the gospel, is that by faith you can walk with God. You see, God is not like a prison guard. You know, a prison guard is somebody who has power to make your life 
uh, comfortable or miserable. And if you just behave well enough, your life will be pretty comfortable. But if you misbehave, your life will be miserable. And a lot of us view God like that. We view God as kind of a prison guard. But that's not who God is. God is a father. You know, the, 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 the illustrations that God uses to describe himself are things like father, shepherd, friend, groom, helper, counselor. Jesus himself is called Emmanuel, God with us. He, he, he is the God who dwells with his people. This is God's desire. And Enoch walked with God. He, he accepted this gracious gift from God and he walked with him. And, and this passage here in Hebrews says that God is pleased and delighted in those who walk with him. It says here in verse 6, And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. You see, in seeking God and in walking with God, there is a great reward. There's a great reward. You get the presence of the living God. The one whom you're made in his image. And you get, to, you get to, when you walk with him, the, the reward is also that you get to bear his presence to a broken world. You know, my wife thinks I'm crazy. And that's because I, you know, as a pastor, I uh, have to officiate many funerals and, and that's always sad. And, um, and after a funeral, I'm, I'm always thinking about what I want my funeral to be. So I frequently think about my funeral and that's why my wife thinks I'm crazy. But I think about what are people going to say on that moment after the pastor gives the, the eulogy and people stand up to start to give parting words and things that they loved about the person. What are people going to say about me? Man, I, I think the highest compliment could be he walked with God. I mean, I think if I had a, a tombstone out there somewhere where somebody would maybe perhaps stumble upon it and and and, and all it said was, he walked with God. That would be the kind of life I would want to be known for. The kind of life that where, where people would be at the funeral saying, I was broken, but because he walked with God, I knew God. I experienced God through him. And that's the kind of people that I want living stones to be. I want us to be a people who are concerned and consumed with walking with God, drawing near to Him, taking His invisible hand through every day of this difficult life, walking with Him. And you know the good thing about walking with Him is anybody can do this. You see, many people have uh, uh, like this fear like God is not as approving of them or something because they don't know, they haven't memorized any books of the Bible or they don't have great Bible knowledge or they just don't know a lot yet. Well, you don't need to have a PhD in theology to walk with God. You just need to walk with him. All you need to do is believe that he exists and try to draw near to him. Yes, read your word. Yes, pray. But the, the goal is to enjoy his presence. This is the goal of human existence. Uh, this passage in Hebrews says that as Enoch walked with God, God took him up. That's why Enoch is one of the craziest stories in the Bible, even though it's this big. It says that he walked with God and God just took him up. That there was a day when Enoch just was taken up into heaven. He went from uh, enjoying the presence of God in a limited way in this broken world to enjoying the presence of God in a full way in heaven. You see, that's what heaven is all about. Heaven is all about the presence of God. When you read about heaven in the scriptures... Uh, you, you read about, yeah, all these great things. You read about, you know, streets of gold and palaces and this place where there's not going to be any crime and all broken things will be made new. But always the highlight of heaven when you read the Bible 
is God is there with his people. And the people are there with God. That's the highlight of heaven. The treasure of heaven is God. I like what John Piper says. He says, the critical question for our age is this. If you were to go to heaven and you were to have perfect health and all your friends and family that you love were there and there was no more strife and you weren't to have sin anymore and there weren't to be any brokenness, if you were to have all of the pleasures that you could possibly imagine in heaven, but God wasn't there, would you be satisfied? And if your answer is yes, I would be satisfied, that would be enough, then you're not getting the point of biblical faith. You see, the hope and the goal of biblical faith is God, walking with God, being with Him in His presence. That's the goal. So Enoch shows us that faith looks like walking with God. And the last example we have here is Noah. Noah shows us that faith looks like taking God at His word. Taking God at His word, even if it sounds crazy. Let's read this last section with Noah. Verse 7, it says, By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and he became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. So here we have the story of Noah. If you go back and you read Genesis chapter 6, you can read the story of Noah. And it says in Genesis 6 that people covered the face of the earth and instead of worshiping God, they gave themselves over to wickedness. And because of that, the world turned violent. Violent is the, violence is the ultimate end of wickedness. And I think, you know, that, that's kind of ever fresh in our minds as we turn on the news every day and we're seeing lots of acts of violence. It's because wickedness is prevailing. And in, in an even more exaggerated way, there was a time when people covered the face of the earth and wickedness was everywhere. And so God was grieved that this was happening. And, and, and he said that he was grieved for making these people. And, and he said, you know what? I'm going to cleanse the earth of wickedness by sending a flood. And at that, that point, um, uh, no rain had come upon the earth. Uh, and, and God said, I'm just going to send a flood and I'm going to cleanse the whole earth. I'm going to cleanse it with my wrath. But he had Noah. And Noah was also a man who walked with God, enjoyed fellowship with God. And he said, Noah... I want you to build a huge ark, like a massive, massive cruise uh, liner type boat. (laughs) And I want you to bring all the the different types of animals of the world onto that boat. And I will preserve you and your family because of your faith. And I will cleanse this world. And so Noah did it. He did it in the face of all the mockery of all the people around. Because it took, you got to think that this boat that he was building was so big, it took him several years to make. But he did it. He just took God at his word. Even though, uh, you know, as of that point, there hadn't been rain, even though Noah had no concept of what a flood even was, Noah said, you know what? I'm going to take God at his word, even though it sounds crazy, because God is trustworthy. We can take God at his word. When God says something, he does it. And when you walk with God, you start to understand that about God. And so faith looks like taking God at his word. And even even when it sounds crazy, so Noah took God at his word. He built this massive boat. He brought his family there, all the animals that God brought to him on it. And then the flood came. And after the flood came, Noah and his family's life was preserved. And the earth was cast into judgment. But Noah's life was preserved because God commended him as righteous for taking him at his word. And so that's the third aspect of faith that we see from this passage. The reason why God is pleased with a life of faith is because it's a life where we take God at his word. If God says it, we do it. And it says here in Hebrews that in doing so, Noah condemned the world. And it just alludes to the fact that 
that Noah took God at his word, even though the whole world was making fun of him, was mocking him, was criticizing him. But in the end, Noah was right. Because Noah preserved, um, Noah preferred the smile of God over the approval of man. I love that. Sinclair Ferguson says that, the great preacher. He says, Noah preferred the smile of God over the approval of man. And that's what faith looks like. And I wonder if you're living that life of faith. Are you living a life that prefers the smile of God over the approval of man? Or are you living a life that, that, that wants everybody to be happy with you and therefore you're not willing to take God at his word? And you know, this comes to every arena in our life. You know, maybe you're a high school student or a college student and you're entering into this life of faith and you're calling yourself a Christian. Well, you know what that means is you got to take God at his word. Noah took God's commands as commands, not suggestions. Noah took God's commands as commands, not good ideas. And that's what the life of faith does. Even when it goes against the tide of culture and our friends and our family, we say, I'm going to choose the smile of God over the approval of man. When it comes to sexuality, when it comes to money, when it comes to relationships, when it comes to forgiving our enemies, when it comes to living a life of service and sacrifice and frugality, I'm going to choose the smile of God over the approval of man. That's what it means. And so uh, Noah shows us this. And, and what this story of Noah shows us also about God is that God is a God who is committed to justice. God is a God who sees the wickedness of the world and is grieved by it. And he's a God who is committed to justice. He is returning to judge the earth. He's promised that he will never again flood the earth, but at the end, he is coming to judge the earth. He is a God who's committed to justice, but he's also a God who's equally committed to grace. That though he has promised judgment, he has also extended a hand of grace, just as he did to Noah. He said, you know, and to Noah, he said, build this ark. To us, he said, trust in my son. God gave Noah a way to escape judgment. And Jesus comes to us and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody can come to the Father except through me. Jesus comes to us and says, I am the truer and better ark who's about to bear the judgment for your wickedness so that you could walk with God. You see, Jesus is our way of grace. And, you know, when we think about that, it actually makes sense why we would have faith in Jesus. You know, if, if uh, Abel shows us that faith is giving God our best, the reason why we gave God our best is because in Jesus, God gives us his best. In Jesus, God holds nothing back. He gives us his first fruits. Um, if, if Enoch shows us that faith looks like walking with God in fellowship, we look to Jesus and we see that Jesus was willing to get off his throne in heaven and take on humanity to walk with us in this life of suffering. If, if, if Noah shows us that faith looks like taking God at his word, we can look to Jesus and say, I can trust that you are trustworthy because you're willing to die on my behalf. You can trust Jesus because Jesus was willing to bear the wrath of hell for your soul. You have no other friends or family who loves you like that. Jesus knew how sinful you were and are. He knew how messed up you are and he still chose to die for you. Therefore, you can trust his commands because you can be confident that he has your best interest in mind. And so therefore, we can take him at his word. And when we do, we can be confident that we will walk in the pleasure of God because it is faith that pleases God. I pray today that you 
would be filled with a life of faith. God, let's pray. Um, God, thank you so much for giving us everything in Jesus. I pray also that you would grant us the gift of faith to give you our best, to enjoy intimacy with you, and to take you at your word, even when your word sounds crazy. Help us, Lord, we pray. Amen. We are going to respond to the gospel we just heard in a time of confession. So often in our lives, we fail to have faith and trust in Jesus. We doubt his provision, his goodness, his love. When we do this, we tend to look inward for hope or in some material possession for hope. Today, let's confess our lack of faith and trust in Jesus and turn to him. Let's do this now in a time of silence. First Corinthians 6, 11 says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Church, we see here that even though at times we are full of doubt, we have been forgiven. By God's grace, may the truth of this scripture allow us to fully trust in our God. Today, as the family of God, we get to remember the faith that has been given to us by God. We do this weekly through communion. As we take the wine, we remember Christ's blood that was shed. When we take the bread, we remember his body broken. As you are served communion, watch this short video and celebrate the faith that has been given to you by God. took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
I searched the world But it couldn't feel me Man's empty praise Treasures of faith Are never enough And you came along And put me back together
One of our core values is outsiders becoming insiders. Let's live into this desire this week and be bold in sharing our faith that has been given to us. Church, in benediction from Galatians 6, 18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. We will see you right back here next Sunday at 11 a.m.